it's sort of interesting, you know, people keep asking me, what's the future for microservices? And I actually kind of hope there'd be less distribution. What I mean by that is the big idea, certainly for enterprises, is that notion of independent deployability. The only reason we're forced into a service-based approach to deliver on independent deployability is because the vast majority of the world don't program on runtimes that allow for true hot swapping of modules. Yes. Um, if our module, if our runtimes really did allow for proper, robust hot swapping of modules, we could have much less distribution. Um, and I think that's, but I don't know if we're ever going to get there, by the way, you know, I, I had hopes for what Jigsaw was with Java, but that, that yeah. doesn't, that they've, they've watered down that mission. And yes, there are people doing cool stuff with Erlang, but the amount of people playing around with Erlang are unfortunately maybe smaller than we might like. Um, yeah. And so we're sort of in that world now where because we want that independence, we're forced to be distributed. And that's, I, I think I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm still, for some people it works really well, but for other people it's just like, what, what, and I think coming back to your point earlier, Dave, I think the reality is a lot of people that aim for microservices get the distribution, but mm -hmm. don't even get the independence. Yes. And so then they're in a situation of not being the, 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 the distributed monolith, uh, being the, the ultimate slam for an architecture. It's like, yeah. you're not even, you're not even on a single process, you're a distributed system. Yeah. And it's a monolithic application and it's like, and then the, the next thing you know is you've got a whole bevy of middle managers and release managers that have to coordinate changes between what everyone else is doing and architects are putting their hairs out and no work's getting done whatsoever. And it's like, you know, that's the stuff I try and help people yeah. avoid, right? You know, it's, it's that. It's, if you if you i think what one of the passions that you and i share and one of the impacts on our programming careers really is a fascination with distributed systems and and your new book building resilient distributed systems is is obviously a reflection of that but also the microservices thing and i i got interested in distributed systems several decades ago before before microservices existed as a thing and, and was i was interested in building complex things but the step from not distributed to distributed is immense it's a huge step in complexity it seems to me you get involved in all kinds of of new problems but <clears throat> you know it's an interesting one because you get to do, you get more freedom to do different kinds of things, build different kinds of systems in many ways, and to scale the development in in different ways. And, yeah. and that stuff is really important when you're building big software. Absolutely, and and <clears throat> from an organisational point of view, right? You've got lots more teams maybe wanting to collaborate yes. on a piece of software. Um, distribution helps you there if you can achieve that independence. But also, coming back to your point about building software in different ways, the moment you have more than one process boundary in the mix, it becomes much easier for you to have a mix of technology. Yeah. And that can be useful to help you experiment. What if we replace this thing with something written in Rust? You know, did it work? Did it not work? Right. Uh, or different runtimes, different chipsets, uh, different deployment platforms. Um, and of course, this is, this is key now when we think about the, the current you know shift towards a lot more systems integrating LLMs, you almost have to anyway, right? Because you are now having to interface with more specialist hardware and things. And, and I think that, so there's, and that's the thing, right? I mean, I think a lot of the people who embark on this journey of building more distributed systems, they see the opportunity. They see yes. the options yes. that are mm. outlaid in front of them. And they're like, I want that. I want all of that. And they don't yeah. see the, the seedy underbelly that lurks underneath, right? Yeah. Um, I, I mean, part of the reason I wanted to write the book a little bit, the, the latest one, was because I spent a lot of time, like at the more complex end of digital systems, you know, trying to get my head around, you know, Byzantine consensus protocols and 
why you should never use uh, Paxos and just stick with Raft because it's simpler to understand, all this sort of stuff. Yeah. But when then I start to sit and I'd have conversations with people about the complexity distributed systems, that stuff is so far removed from the work they're actually doing that, that you're not mm. having the same thing. So it's very difficult to, to say something simply. So trying to like pair back and pair back and... So I've, I've come up with my uh, my three golden rules of the distributed systems, right? Which I th is sort of, I'm very happy with at this point. An old colleague of ours, Ben Butler-Cole, added a third element, right? Otherwise it would be an incomplete model. But and this is, the idea is trying to share to people, these are the three problems you've got with distributed systems. Understand that they exist. And, and all the other things we talk about are kind of extensions from that, right? So we've got this idea that the first thing, you can't be information instantaneously between two points. It takes time. Yeah. I mean, that's yeah. just physics. Yeah. Yes, I'm aware of quantum entanglement. No, it's not a networking protocol. And then the next thing is sometimes the thing you want to talk to isn't there, right? You just can't reach it. Yeah. Except that that might be, it might be not happening very often, but sometimes. And the third thing is that resource pools are not infinite, right? Yeah. Resources can be. And really, when you get down to all these other complexities we look at, those are the, kind of the three rules. So then you start thinking, oh, well, distributed systems are really simple then because only three things I've got to think about. And then I'm like, yeah, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But they're, they're quantum physics level things. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I don't plan, I don't, I don't claim to, that to be anywhere near as rigorously thought out as, as, as quantum physics. But um, so I've been going sort of, when I've been writing the book, it's like, well, where would I start then? Where would I start someone who, has had to build a distributed system or has found yeah. themselves building a distributed yeah. system. What would I want them to be thinking about? And so literally the first chapter I sat down to write was on timeouts. Hmm. Let's just deal with the simple stuff first. Like yeah. what is a timeout? Why would you probably need it? How do you set one? And, um, and like just going, walking through that process, I think I found it quite, I don't know, quite cathartic. maybe is the wrong word, but like, I was able just to sort of come back and try and think from first principles a bit. And that was, that was, it's been a lot of fun actually writing that. This clip was taken from my podcast, The Engineering Room with Dave Farley, a monthly podcast with some of the brightest minds in software engineering. You can find full episodes on all your favorite podcast platforms, including Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and Amazon Music. Your support helps us to bring the, you these regular episodes. So please leave your positive review on your preferred podcast platform to help us to continue to grow and bring you great guests and their insights. Thank you very much for listening.